everyone. I hope you have a cup of tea or a snack, maybe. Get yourself a snack. This is a video I have been meaning to do since I started YouTube back in January at the beginning of the year. And it's been very difficult for me to try and talk about. But it's been a very popular theme in my vlogs lately, which has actually eased me into doing this video. On top of that, I've had a lot of you ask me particular questions about endometriosis that I've been trying to reply in the best way possible, but it's difficult without telling you the whole story. So hence why I'm doing this. And it's also endometriosis awareness month so i really can't think of a better time to sit down and talk to you guys about endometriosis itself and my personal story with endometriosis to tell you a little bit about endometriosis to begin with um it is a condition where lining or tissue similar to that of the uterus lining grows outside of the uterus so it can cover fallopian tubes it can cover ovaries the bladder the bowel, parts of the small intestine, lungs, nerves, muscle. It's even been found on the brain before. So it's a whole body condition. A lot of people, because a lot of the early symptoms are revolve around periods, a lot of people think it is solely to do with the female reproductive system, but it is a whole body condition and it can completely affect your whole entire body. Because it is a lining similar to that of the uterus lining. Only those assigned female at birth do get endometriosis and one in 10 women will have it or develop it at some point in their life, which is a scary number considering that not a lot is known or done about it. There are four stages of endometriosis, one to four, and the stages do not necessarily mean how painful they are the higher the number, the deeper is tissue and the higher coverage it has over the body that where it's spread. It can cause cysts, lesions, adhesions, and if left untreated and if it goes deep enough into the tissue of what it's attached to, it can cause cancer and it can be fatal on its own. There is no cure, only treatment. And it takes on average eight to 10 years to be diagnosed with endometriosis. That's just a brief. I may go into more depth into, in another video if there is enough interest. I do want to say that I haven't been 100% diagnosed with endometriosis just yet. It's very difficult to identify the actual tissue but I have a lot of the symptoms. All of the symptoms, actually, I would say. Um, and my doctors are pretty convinced it's what it is. And so am I. <laughs> um, the thing, another thing with endometriosis is that sometimes it doesn't show up on ultrasound scans, even if they are internal. Because of the nature of what endometriosis tissue looks like, it needs to be seen often with a camera through a laparoscopy. And that is when it is treat treated. So sometimes people don't even know if it 100% is endometriosis until they are going in for the treatment. In terms of what endometriosis looks like, it can kind of vary. It can be bumps on the surface of the tissue and discoloration. Uh, and sort of lumps or change in texture which is why it is very unlikely to be seen on a ultrasound. Now about my story for context I am 25 years old and I am just under three weeks away from my first laparoscopy. My story <laughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly stop me there. <laughs> um, 
I'm, I'm going to put a trigger warning on this. Um, I do talk about blood. I do talk about quite gory details of the symptoms of endometriosis. And I also do mention the mental health side of endometriosis. So I do talk about self-harm and suicide. Started when I was 12 years old. So this has been going on for half of my life. When I first got my period at 12, nearly 13, it I bled a lot for a first period, but I didn't have many cramps or much pain. I started my period quite young in comparison to those around me. I carried on for another couple of months with a lot of blood, but not a lot of pain until one day I was completely flawed by my period. The cramps were completely out of this world. Nothing I'd ever felt before. And I was sick a lot. I was nauseous, could barely walk, and I had to sit in a bath for the rest of the day. And when it went to go into bed, I was dosed up with paracetamol and given a hot water bottle and went to bed because that is all we could do at the time. My mum, having a rather acute awareness for feminine health, my mum took me straight to the doctor. The outcome was not what we expected and I was told that it was just my hormones settling down. I just started my period. So my hormones were settling down and I just had to grip my teeth and bear it for another couple of months. So that is what I did. Um, again, next month came around and off school again in the bath throwing up unable to eat unable to really carry a proper conversation because the pain was so intense and when you're 12 13 years old you think you're about to die <laughs> um it was around this time that my skin broke out and i had quite bad acne and the doctor actually did more about my acne than <laughs> the pain I was in. So my mum took me back to the doctor to mention the acne because it was very painful for me as well as my periods and my doctor said there was nothing he could do specifically for my periods but he could put me on a hormonal contraceptive that would regulate my, my hormones and potentially settle my acne. Yeah, he cared more about my acne than he did my stomach, literally tearing itself to shreds. So I went on this contraceptive pill, which you came off every three weeks for a week and you had an artificial period. Now, I was not in any pain in this time. It was great. I thought all my problems were solved until my anxiety got incredibly bad, as did my depression. And I began self-harming on my thighs and arms. I was back and forth to the doctors for anti-anxiety medication. At one point with the panic, I was even on beta blockers. And it wasn't until I went back for a change from sertraline to another pill that I was told that a lot of girls who were on the pill that I was on were going through the same thing. This was a new doctor, a stand-in doctor, because my usual doctor was away. <clears throat> and she took me off the pill straight away and offered me the hormonal implant, which I had in the top of my right arm. Everything seemed okay with the implant. I didn't have to worry about taking the pill every day. There was a potential that I wouldn't bleed the whole time I had the implant. There was a potential that I could have normal periods. And there was also potential that I would bleed the whole time that I was on the implant, which is what happened to me. I bled all the time. And then because I was constantly wearing pads or tampons, I suffered with a lot of cystitis. Uh, after six months, I went back to the doctor and said, this isn't working for me, please can you take it out? The doctor said, no, try another three months. Nine months later, I went back, please, can you take this out now? It's horrible. I'm constantly 
taking antibiotics for cystitis? No, give it more time. I ended up having the hormonal implant for about a year and a half before it was finally taken out of me. They said that they didn't want to take the hormonal implant out without putting another contraceptive in or putting me straight onto another contraceptive, which is fair enough. So I had <clears throat> the copper coil. Now, copper kills sperm. There's no hormones in it whatsoever. So to me, there was no risk of the bleeding all the time. There was no risk of the irregularities. It wasn't an artificial period. I was told before I had the coil put in that it can make periods heavier and that it can make them more painful. I was under the impression that my periods could not get any more painful and they couldn't get any heavier. And I was correct. They didn't get any more painful and they didn't get any heavier, but it completely discredited every time I went back to the doctor about my periods. I would go to the doctor and I would say, you know, my periods are very heavy. I can't go to school, college, I'm throwing up, I'm having cramps that make me stop in my tracks and double over in pain it's affecting my life and they're very heavy I'm passing out it was completely dismissed because I was on the copper coil when I told them that my periods were like this back when I started them when I was about 12 13 right up to when I was 14 when I was put on the pill I was told I was a liar because my periods were so irregular I was having a period for a day and then I would go three days without one and then I would have a period for a week and a half or I would have a period for a week, then I wouldn't be on my period for three months, and then I'd have three weeks of being on my period. So I missed a lot of college. My social life was scuppered, as was my college life. And I ended up having to do a lot of pregnancy tests because I genuinely thought in those three month gaps that there could have been a poss possibility that I was pregnant. I never ever was, but it was always in the back of my mind because they were so all over the place and completely unpredictable. There was no way of tracking them. There was no way of knowing when I was at my most fertile, if I was having sex at that time. I, it was around that time that I then started passing clots. And when I passed my first clot, I thought I was having a miscarriage. And that was possibly one of the scariest things I have ever done. Um, I thought for a good hour that I had just lost a baby. <clears throat> and when I realised that it was a clot, I then actually became scared for my life because you don't get taught this in school. You don't get taught about endometriosis or polycystic ovaries in school. So when you start having these symptoms, you either carry on and think that they're totally normal when they're not and you're seriously unwell, or you think you're gonna die. Because the copper coil you can have for 10 years, I kept it right up until quite recently, actually, I'd say a couple of years ago. So throughout the next parts of these stor this story, I was on, I had the copper coil. I was taking no end of painkillers each time my period came around. I was taking time off work, taking time off school. I was being sick. <laughs> it was just a nightmare. Passing clots, the clots became the norm. I was going through pad upon pad upon pad it was around this time that I started to become quite open about my periods because I'd spoken about them a lot with doctors and as did my friends. And I had been told that this was normal. This is what was to be expected when you were a woman and you had a cycle. I started talking to my friends about it and they were just using light tampons and panty liners and maybe at the heaviest part of their period, the night pads. I was going through night pads during the day, within hours of each other. I couldn't wear tampons. There was no way I could wear tampons. I'd just be changing them constantly. And pads, I always had leaks. It was easier to wear skirts and dresses. 
and it was trousers and white jeans were completely out of the question as were light blue jeans my friends were never missing college or work because of their period my friends were never missing nights out or social events my friends were never taking painkillers or at this point i think for my pain i was on naproxen my friends had never been prescribed medication to help their periods be more bearable I couldn't even have my friends over. I was in such a state. And it was really isolating. I went back to the doctor again. And I was sent away for a ultrasound. Just an external ultrasound, which came back. Everything was okay. Everything was fine. Calm down, everything's okay. I think I ended up having about three or four more ultrasounds that came back clear before I was finally sent through for a internal and external. When I got to about the age of 20, 21, the pain consumed my lower back and my hips. Sex started to become painful. And all the time, every now and then, um, I couldn't do certain positions, which when you're 21, that freaking sucks. Again, it was only then when I said sex hurt and I had a partner at the time that a doctor did something about it. Because my partner was suffering. He couldn't have sex properly. So I had an internal and an external ultrasound, which came back that I had polycystic ovaries. Both of my ovaries appeared polycystic on the scan. Amazing. I finally have some kind of answers. So I was given a pamphlet all about polycystic ovaries and what foods I should and shouldn't avoid. And I started doing all these things and nothing got better. Again, when I went back to the doctor, I was told to carry on, give it another six months. Just palmed off all the time, or given more painkillers, given higher painkillers, a higher dosage of my painkillers, or stronger painkillers, to the point where I gave up. I did, I gave up. And maybe I'd be further along in my journey now, if I hadn't have given up for a couple of years. But I can't dwell on that. <laughs> Um, it's easily done, unfortunately. I put myself on a strict diet. Um, read blog after blog after blog. Forum after forum after forum post of polycystic ovary syndrome. Completely adapted my whole life around polycystic ovary syndrome. And then everything got worse. I'd say when I turned 22, 23 was the first time I, I contemplated unaliving myself because of the pain. My back and my hips sometimes made me completely immobile. My sciatic nerve started to become triggered a lot, which made work incredibly difficult. Everything was like I was wading through treacle and that was when the fatigue started, like really hit. I was tired a lot of the time. And I just didn't think it was ever gonna end. I didn't think life was ever going to get any better pain wise someone kicked me up the ass <laughs> someone really kicked me up the ass and told me to go back to the doctor now i initially went to the doctor about my suicidal thoughts and it was a lady a lady doctor who was covering for someone again they're always freaking covering for someone and you see them once you never freaking see them again and she asked me why I thought I was having these thoughts little did I know she'd already looked at my records and had a rough idea of what I was about to say and I told her the pain basically every day in my back and my hips and it's affecting my job, it's affecting my life. I'm tired all the time and people think I'm lazy and my periods are all over the place 
and at this point I really wanted kids and I just had a gut feeling that I, it wasn't going to happen. She looked at me and she said, it says here you've got polycystic ovaries. How did they diagnose you? I said I had a scan. So at what point of your cycle did you have your scan? At what point? I have no idea. My periods have always been all over the place. I don't have a clue at what point of my cycle this scan was taken. I'm going to send you for another scan. I asked her why, because at this point I had this guilt that I was draining NHS resources because of my head. I didn't think I was worth it. And she said, because of how the egg is released when it pulses and the thing gets pushed down and the egg is released from your ovaries, on the scan, your ovaries can appear polycystic. And I didn't have polycystic ovaries. <laughs> went back to arrange a follow-up appointment with this doctor and she'd gone. So I went to see another doctor, told her all my issues. She told me, I think it's an STI, sent me to the sexual health clinic where I burst into tears in front of this guy who was asking me very specific questions about my sex life and what holes things were going in. I had the full works done. I was tested for everything. HIV, um, pfft, everything. And I got. I said I was scared. And he said, what are you scared of? I said, this has been going on for so long. I'm, I don't know what it is. You think you have cancer, don't you? And I said, I mean, yeah, it could be a possibility. And he said to me, oh, no, 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 no. You're too young to have cancer. I was angry, really angry at this point, but I just didn't know what to say. Because there are kids, you're completely discrediting children that lose their lives or lose their childhood fighting that word. And that's your reassurance. There's nothing medical in that, like information to back that up. That I just thought that was just a dick thing to say. <laughs> anyway. Lo and behold, all my test results came back negative and I didn't have any STIs and this woman was stumped. She didn't know what could be wrong with me. So again, I gave up. In this time, I had the word endometriosis thrown at me a few times. But when I said, what are you gonna do about it? I never really got an answer. The last six to eight months in particular have been the worst, symptom wise. I asked for a smear test when I was 20, when I was 21, when I was 22 when I was 23, when I was 24. When I had a smear test when I turned 25, after all of these smear tests that had been poo-pooed, my smear test came back positive for HPV and abnormal cells. Luckily, it was only the first stage, the first level, and it's something that may go away on its own. I will now have to have smear tests every year which is fine by me. But I just think that's a very huge indicator that we're not taken seriously. At all. When I was having my <laughs> smear, I, it hurt me. It hurt because there's, some, there's something going in you. Now the lady thought it was because I was embarrassed and I said to her, I've been pulled about. I've been pulled about by every Tom, Dick and Harry in here. Should have was that? Well, you know, I, I've had the word endometriosis chucked at me. I've had the word some hormonal condition chucked at me. Da -da 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 -da. And she started asking me about my symptoms and my journey and hers sounded very similar to mine. And she said endometriosis doesn't always show up on scans. Because when I said endometriosis, I said it was only mentioned to me because it never showed up anywhere. And I'd had scans and I couldn't find anything. So I didn't show up on scans. Very rarely, actually. And she knew because she had it. 
she got her doctor to ring me the next day. Her and the, the female doctor who left or was fleeting. If it wasn't for them hearing me, really, really hearing me when I needed them to the most, I don't think I'd be here today. I know I wouldn't be here today. So the next day, doctor rings me. I list off my symptoms, which at this point were painful sex, pain when I'm going for a wee, pain when I'm going for a poo. Sometimes when I sit down and I relax too much, it feels like I'm getting barbed wire pulled out through my butthole. So I have to tense up and then slowly release myself into the seat. I still get that now. Nausea, vomiting, irregular periods, pain in between periods, spotting in between periods. I had more and he stopped me there and he told me he can't believe I hadn't had a laparoscopy yet. Which was so bittersweet at the same time because I kind of knew it was like the beginning of something, of an actual something happening. But it just took this one guy to really hear me. Sorry, I've got myself together. But it just took this one guy to really hear me to get the ball rolling. I then get my smear test results back, which as I say, were positive of HPV and abnormal cells. And I call up to book an appointment for my biopsy. And while I was on the phone, I said, how long is the wait list to see a gynecologist? Even though this was like the sixth gynecologist I've seen from the hospital. I was told very casually that it was going to be two and a half years before I even see someone. This isn't before I have a laparoscopy. This is before I see someone. I then say, what if I put myself on the cancellation list? Two years. <laughs> that broke my heart. But luckily I am in a position where I can see a private doctor and a private surgeon. Hence why my laparoscopy is in three weeks and not in two years time. I don't think I'd make the two years. When I went to my consultation with this private doctor, a specialist in endometriosis about an hour and a half away, he suggested a laparoscopy basically straight away. I don't know who I am, not being in pain. The last nine months have been the worst. I'm in pain every day with hip and lower back pain. And I have to take a lot of time off work. I'm actually signed off work at the moment. Because I can't actually do more than two days work without aggravating something and setting off a flare-up. My flare-ups have started getting so bad that I feel like my arms and my legs are dead. I can't lift my arms up above my head and I have pins and needles tingling in my lower leg and feet. I was admitted to hospital two weeks ago and I was given morphine and I had a urine infection because I couldn't pee properly because of the pain. It can give me migraines and sometimes I have pains in my chest. It's pretty serious. If you know someone who is fighting endo, go give them a hug. Go make them hot chocolate, hear them out and listen to them because endometriosis is not just a painful period. Sometimes it's, you don't even have a period and you still have pain. It's a whole body disease. It affects everything. And if you have endo, keep screaming. Really make yourself heard. Because you're fucking brave. Basically unstoppable. <laughs> because we're fighting against our bodies every day. Everyone with a chronic illness is. Fighting against our own freaking bodies every bloody day. And we still get by. And yeah, some days our productivity is different to others, but we're still productive. Even if it means getting up and eating breakfast, or one day you actually get to go out for a walk. There's a massive idea going around that our productivity is the sole 
contributor to our worth and that is definitely something that I need to unlearn because it is only Tuesday of my week of being signed off and I couldn't lay in bed again so I got up did my makeup and filmed two videos do I hurt now yeah should I have moved about so much today probably not but finding a balance between not missing out on things doing the things you love and seeing the people you love and not overdoing it it's freaking tough I've been trying to do it for about 10 years and it's hard really hard I just want to take the time to say thank you <laughs> to all my friends at work and all my friends out of work. Um, you've all been amazing and really supportive and I love you all so, so fucking much. Best friends, old and new. If there are any questions you have from this video, let me know. I will answer them as best I can in the comments. I try to be as clear as I can. But like I say, I find this difficult to talk about. And it is a very long time span to try and remember every detail over. So any questions, please ask them in the comments. Um, while you're at it, maybe give my Instagram a follow. And I will keep you updated on my laparoscopy on there daily when I'm healing and isolating. And I will be doing a video on here of my laparoscopy if you are interested in me doing a video solely on endometriosis alone i will be more than happy to do that especially if i can do it in this month in endometriosis awareness month but thank you so much if you could share this let everyone know that there are so many women out there fighting this disease people need to know about it people need to know the symptoms and the signs so they can help their friends and family and themselves and I will see you next time, but thank you for watching.